now until we hear from the Orange County Health Department. So welcome. This is the Sunday services for August 2nd. We have one Sunday service a month now, the first Sunday of every month. Please tell your women friends this is for women only. Today we have, of course, our NIADs, the core facilitators, including myself, of the Goddess Temple of Orange County Sunday services, Mata and uh, Marsha the Nyads, and we have our guest speaker, longtime member, wise woman, teacher, longtime teacher at uh, the Goddess Temple. She taught many, many wonderful Goddess 101 classes, a Wiccan, an amazing teacher, somebody I've worked with for many years, Sandy Limina. We're so happy to have you here, Sandy. And we also have on and she'll be more formally introduced later. We also have on uh, honored guest. She's not our guest speaker today, but I am going to call upon her to speak a little bit about Sekhmet. Uh, she has a deep knowledge of Sekhmet and a deep relationship. And one of the things that she said that really struck me, because I felt the same way, although I had not put it into words, she put it into words for me many, many years ago. Sekhmet was the only goddess uh, the only divinity or deity she felt was personally looking at her. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's exactly my experience. That's exactly my experience. And just tell me if, if I said that correctly or, or not. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Bingo. And um, it's an uncanny feeling. It's a very tangible feeling. And so... Um, it bespeaks, I guess, of a relationship with her, or she's, I like to think of her as stalking me, you know, as her prey, <laughs> and grabbing me by the throat, and making, shaking me, and, and waking me up, and, and yeah, because she is the, she's the, uh, known as being undefeatable, uh, she cannot be defeated, and she is, a, she is a protector of the earth, protector of truth, She's the ruler of serpents and dragons. I mean, what more do you want, you know? We had a wonderful ceremony regarding Sekhmet many years ago where we recited together about 40 women all her appellations throughout the years. And there were, I don't know, like 180 that we could find, and there's probably many more. But it created just saying her different names you know, the mighty one, the lady of the breath of the desert, the, you know, all these appellations, it created an astonishing energy in the room. It was just, just, wow. <laughs> she is a dark goddess. That's the thing. She's a goddess of fire and of the sun, and S-U-N, you know, but she's a dark goddess. And she's also the goddess of, of female sexuality and childbirth and healing. So, I mean, she's got it all, you know, the whole package. We, we, are, we are going to learn more about her. So let's let's close okay. it out there. I don't right. want to I don't want to ruin all the surprises. Uh, That's okay. Uh, there's right. no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to you, Sandra. Sandy, oh, your your I'm presentation. Looking forward to sharing with you too, Marsha. <laughs> the earliest it may, might not feel like autumn, but autumn is the time of the queen, and autumn actually begins in August, August, September, October and then November, December, January is winter for us in our, in our culture. So it, this is about uh, Sekhmet today, and this whole season is about the queen archetype, maiden, mother, queen, and wise woman. We're focusing on the queen this quarter, uh, as we always do, and her element of water. So if we have time, we'll touch in on all of those things. May we turn it over to the naiads, to Mata and Marsha, to please carry out a purification in their own fashion, perhaps with the element of water, if that's what they've chosen. There's no original sin in our beliefs. There's only original beauty. So we're not purifying because there's something wrong with us. We're purifying because sometimes, 
you know, the dominator model just like, you know, gets a little crud on you. And like at the end of the day, you got to take a bath to wash off the day. So this is our way of just releasing the lies uh, of that patriarchy and the don dominator model tell about women. So just consider this your spiritual bath, just getting rid of patriarchal lies. So take it away, Marta and Marsha. In this bowl, frankincense and local flowers and herbs and water. And sacred water, that which is always finds its own level. This is a sanctifying, as Ava says, it's not cleansing, but I see shining, everything's shining up. Like you see the sparkling of water in the sun, the diamonds in the beads of diamonds, uh, and the water droplets in the sunlight on a river that flows. This is what is connecting with each and every one of you, your auras, the water in your bodies. It's cleansing, it's clear, it's empowering. You feel this sanctifying, this vibration of the holiness of water that moves throughout your body, throughout connecting with the universe, connecting with sweet segment, connecting with this time. So be it. The waters that I have, fragrant with lavender, fresh and clean. Just as the waters that flow through our bodies, flows through us, we are already whole and complete. We go through this world flowing gently like water. It's like a spiritual bath. Just as this water is complete in its formlessness. We as women, we are all connected. Cool, refreshing, healing waters. It connects us all together. We are one, we are complete, we are whole. Mm. Goddesses of the water, blessed be. Blessed be, blessed be. And may we call upon Vajra to give us a brief acknowledgement, invocation, if you like, of, of Sekhmet in the way you know her. Great goddess of the sun, the life-giving sun, great goddess protector. We ask your presence here, your lioness roar, your lioness strength, your deep sexuality, your prowess as woman lioness, as goddess. We ask you to imbue us with the knowledge power that you hold that is appropriate for each woman today. Awaken us. You are the awakener of the womb. And we ask you to awaken our wombs that we may go forth into the world with courage and strength, the courage and strength that you have and that lives in us. We are so grateful for your knowledge and that you have returned to the knowledge of human consciousness in this modern day, we need you. Protect the earth, protect the people fighting for justice. Protect us all. We love you. We love you. You are here, blessed be. Blessed be, blessed be. We acknowledge north, south, east and west, air, fire, water and earth. We acknowledge the guides and guardians of each individual woman present here. We acknowledge all the living beings who wish to support this work. 
since all is one, none of these things can be called in or dismissed. We can only acknowledge them as always being present, as always being us. And we do so now. We are here. We are here. We are here. Hail and welcome. Hail and welcome. This video is very typical of those you will find on YouTube supposedly educating us about the ancient goddess Sekhmet. These videos do not tell of the original Sekhmet, the original goddess of the land of what is now called Egypt and venerated even beyond, far beyond. This disinformation retells the denigrating stories of goddesses, the stories told the world over by men starting a few thousand years ago. This was in an effort to overturn the truth of the great mother of all life. Thousands of years ago, <laughs> All humanity, the world over, venerated the Great Mother as nurturing, kind, compassionate, healing, and the creatrix and provider of all life. When average men wanted to control woman, when they wanted to control animals and the land, they knew they had to rewrite the stories of goddess to depict an entity who was capricious, uncontrollable, and either evil, <laughs> crazy, or foolish, or in some stories, all three. An entity, a female entity that was stripped of her power, a female that had to be controlled by males in order to protect humanity from her. And thus began the rewriting of the stories of goddess. The original stories, the stories of goddess as good, as compassionate, as helpful to humanity, as the life giver of humanity as the life protector and defender. These true stories are still held by temples like ours, by teachers like ours. The lies are told by men on YouTube. Now, mostly these men are not malicious. They simply don't know the truth and they are just repeating what they have heard from other men before them. So get your pen and paper ready and let's see if we can count the lies told in the following brief, very nicely made video of lies. At the end of the video, we will tell the truth about Sekhmet. We will remember it together, the truth about goddess, and we'll see how these lies harm women, women today. What lies are told about goddess are lies told by men about woman. When goddess can be denigrated, dismissed, and denied, so can women in our society. When goddess can be controlled by men's stories, men's lies, men's mythology of woman, so can today's woman. We reject this attempt entirely. We tell the truth about Sekhmet. Okay. <laughs> Remember, almost everything you are about to hear in this very nicely made video are falsehoods. 
and the perpetration of the idea of goddess as evil. Know this, it is damaging to every woman on the planet today. Okay, let's go. Sekhmet is the goddess of revenge in Egyptian mythology. She is depicted as a woman with a lioness's head. The name Sekhmet means the powerful one. According to some versions, she was the daughter of Ra, the sun god. Therefore, she is also identified as a sun goddess. Ra generated Sekhmet to punish those who refused to obey God's designs. The lion goddess came down from heaven to earth and began to avenge those who disrespected Ra. The goddess was relentless with those who were not faithful to Ra. Sekhmet spread terrible diseases and devoured Ra's enemies. However, the goddess started to find delight in bloodshed. The goddess's bloodthirst was so immense that Sekhmet began to target the innocent. Ra was worried to see that his daughter was now out of control. To appease her quest for blood, he prepared a bait. Ra offered wine to the lion goddess. She thought it was blood due to its coloring. She gladly drank the wine. The drink calmed the goddess and the sun god managed to bring her back to heaven. Sekhmet was also considered a warrior goddess, the defender of Egypt. Egyptian soldiers believed that Sekhmet was fighting alongside them against Egypt's enemies. After bloody battles, the priests who followed the army arranged ceremonies for the protection granted by the lion goddess. These ceremonies also appeased the goddess and signaled that bloodshed was no longer necessary. Sekhmet was also considered the protector of the pharaohs. She was always standing by the sovereign's side until the day of his death. Then she still followed him to the other world. When a hot wind blew, the Egyptians believed it was the lion goddess's breath. Just as the goddess was capable of spreading diseases to punish her enemies, she could also stop any disease. The Egyptians begged Sekhmet to cure them. For this reason, the goddess was also known as the Lady of Life. She was mainly worshipped in the city of Memphis. On the last day of the year, a great festival was celebrated in her honor. This celebration was accompanied by much wine, as they wished to please Sekhmet, avoiding the fury of the powerful and vengeful goddess. of us who have studied Sekhmet and have a relationship with Sekhmet are just internally screaming <laughs> because this is not the only video of this kind. This is the best one. This is the, the one that has the least amount of crap in it. And so that's why I chose it. It also had some good information at the very end as a, like a little tail thing. Oh, by the way, she's, you know, also about life. Sandy is our guest speaker. So we will give her most of the floor so that she can, she can share her information and knowledge and wisdom with us. So why don't you start us off, Sandy? Uh, the things I wanted to do today was tell you some facts about Sekhmet from ancient Egypt online, which you can go check for yourself. It's much more factual than some of the lies that we have been told from the king, the recent kingdoms. Then I wanted to share some Sekhmet stories with you. And I'll have a meditation I'd like to do so you can actually begin to experience your own relationship with Sekhmet. And after that, then I wanted to do some sharing. I only have 20 minutes or 25. So let's look at Sekhmet. Because she has all of these attributes, the healing, the um, creativeness, as well as the destruction, the, the lady of life, the lady of destruction, the lady of all of the Nile, she is one of the most, if not the most ancient in the pantheon of goddesses of Egypt. And I think Vajra would agree with me on that. I see her as the, the original goddess of the land. Um, her name actually means desert. And her breath was supposedly created the desert. When I first saw her, I knew nothing about her. And 
she was gold, like the desert. And I go, well, that makes sense. It's the sound of the desert. And I was in a class with Ruth Barrett. We were learning how to take aspects of a goddess and, and work with those and speak from that, that place of the goddess. And we had a mask that we were wearing. And the first thing that I got was, I am not just about revenge. And I had no idea what her myth was or anything about her. And I'm like, why would she say that to me? Because I'm thinking of a woman with a lion head and she has the characteristics of a lion. And lions are not about revenge, especially female lions. Female lions do all the hunting. They care for their young. They protect. The, the males are kind of around to just scare people, right? And to produce a new brood. <laughs> but it's the female lion that does everything for the group. So I'm like, why would she say that? And then I looked at her myth and supposedly, and this came later, it came in the later kingdom of Egypt. It wasn't the original one. The later one was the, the, um, the she was the eye of Ra. Ra got mad, and they and people were not following his laws and preserving Maat, which is the justice. So he sent his daughter, the eye of Ra, and sent her in the form of a lion, and it, and it was composed of Hathor, who is the cow goddess. So there was a company, they tried to combine her and take her fierceness, put her into Hathor when she was the original one. Eventually they had to separate her because she wouldn't, just, she wouldn't take it. So she, she, um, Ra ordered her to stop, but she would not. So he poured beer, jugs of beer stained with pomegranate juice to fool her to think it was blood. And so she got drunk and stopped her rampage. And that's where their feast came from. And I actually think the Feast of Cavelli later in Rome was kind of combined with that, which came from um, Egypt. But originally she was the red lady from the desert, not the red lady from the blood. I, to me, that signifies menstrual blood, the lady of the womb the lady of life, and that the sending of plagues is possibly her protection, but she can also cure them if she's your friend. The fact that she was combined with all these other deities, they could never combine her. She, she ended up being by herself. She's considered patron of physicians and healers. They had to put her with a husband and with a son to make her palatable for the, the raw administration, I want to say, that came after in the later kingdom of Egypt. Raja, you can probably speak more to that. But to me, when I first met her in that, I'm going revenge, what is that? So I'm like, okay, whatever. And Mandalina was a wonderful segment. She became the stalker. And then she made the first statue I have of Sekhmet. It's this little tiny resin mold from a mold that Mandalina made. And it actually had a, um, has a little thing on the top where you can hang it like on a Yule tree. <laughs> so she had on my Yule tree for many years. And you can see that she's got the, the sun disc on her head. And she's standing with the woman with the lion head. And for many years, I just kind of patted her on the head and said, oh, I kind of like Sekhmet. She's, she's a nice lion goddess, and lions protect people. And then I went to the Sekhmet temple outside Las Vegas. And we sat and we had a fire in the middle with our, our group. And it was the original statue they had there. And she had on one of those, I call them Phoenician crowns, a high crown. And I was sitting to one side of her, and she was fairly small, but the crown was fairly tall. And I swear, Roger, you'll know what I'm talking about. She turned her head, and she looked straight at me. Baja calls it indwelling. Um, the, when I went to Egypt, 
and I met her there. And one of the priests, a hidden priest, there is a cult of Sekhmet there at Karnak, said that, talked about activating the statue. That's the same as indwelling. We walked and walked and walked. I was on a cane and um, Ruth Anna was with us. She would understand. And I didn't think I was going to make it. And finally, I just started doing a cadence. And, and I don't remember what I was doing, but it was some kind of a rhythm. And as I went up the, the slope to get to this back room at the very farthest edge of this, this complex, there was a, a priest of, of Sekhmet standing there, nodding and keeping time with me as I finally made it up the ramp. And as we went in, they locked us in. We weren't supposed to be there. This was a special arrangement with the curator of the museum. And we went in and there was a sec statue of Sekhmet 3,000 years old. 3,000 years old. She was standing. She was a little taller than us, maybe by a foot. But she wasn't that much taller than an average person. She had the lotus in one hand and the ankh in the other. I walked in and she looked at me. She looked at me. Several of the women were activated and started wailing, especially one in particular about all of the, the things that women have lost, how we once were powerful and now we no longer have power. And I kind of went, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm here. The priest said something about activating, and there I was, right there, with my hands on Sekhmet. And this is a statue from there. It's backwards. She didn't have the ankh here. She had the ankh in the other hand. And of course, seeing it on, on Zoom, it's going to be backwards anyway. But what what for me was important was to understand that Sekhmet has a following. She is a live goddess. And she is revered. There are people there working with her to protect women and children in Karnak, in Egypt, in a Muslim country. And um, as I'm activating and working with the statue, the priest looked at me and I and I nodded and he came over and put his hands on her shoulder as I had one on her heart and her womb. And because he's going to be there, he's going to be the one working with the women and he has an assistant there who's a woman to, to bring back the oldest of the old, the mother of all, the triple goddess who, in, who includes birth, and death and healing and protects her children. So to me, to be able to be there and to experience her in her original form, very not the original form, but one of her most ancient forms and to know that her lineage, if you will, continues throughout the world, especially where she was birthed. Was very significant. So this and these are my segment stories. And here's another statue of her. That uh, we were there, and uh, one of the vendors came running across the parking lot as I'm limping along, getting to the bus. Miss, miss, you must have this. You must have this. <laughs> so I had to go back and, and give him. And it's not charged like the the basalt one, but. I like the story because it's like, you must have this, you must have this. <laughs> because I do. She lives in my heart. She rules. She, and she's also in other pantheons. She's in India, where she is associated with Durga. And what is she called? Let me find the name. Um, I'm sorry, I can't find the name, but you can check it. Pratangiri? Pratangiri? 
thank you. <laughs> and she, in many of the, the murals in the temples, you will see Sekhmet handing the kingship or the the ankh and the the, the the flail, I guess it is, where they are crossed like this, and she's actually handing it to the king. To me, looking at different religions around the world, the ancient ones, especially the Neolithic, the king had to have permission from the land to rule. And you will see Sekhmet, the lady of the land, giving the pharaoh permission to rule. So the myths that you hear about the Eye of Ra and her vengeance and destroying everything was created similarly to some of the other religions in the world that have overtaken the, the matrifocal ones to focus on the hierarchy the male hierarchy to give them credence to rule at the expense of doing away with the nurturing. But Sekhmet, and this is also from Egypt, Sekhmet has never gone away. The land is still there and she still rules the land. I want you to close your eyes if you would, please get comfortable. Let's go in and let's meet Sekhmet. See what she means to you. Find a comfortable place, lie down if you want to. Your eyes can be soft or they can be awake, they can be closed. If you have a statue of segment, you might want to look at her or a picture. And as you're relaxing and you're breathing in and breathing out, notice your breath. Be sure you breathe into your womb space, connecting your body. Just noticing if there's any pain or discomfort, just letting it go, letting the breath breathe it out. The breath of Sekhmet clearing you, relaxing you, cleansing you. And as you relax, you begin to see a light in front of you. It gets a little brighter and a little brighter. And you realize this is sunlight shining through your eyes, through your closed eyes. You open your eyes and you find you are in the desert. It is midday. Your feet are bare. They are in the sand. Surprisingly, it's not hot on your feet, and you are not too hot, just a little warm. And the sand is swirling, there's a little breeze. You don't see much, just a little haze, some sand, but you begin to notice that the wind is bringing you whispers. Sa, sahem. Sahu, sa, sahem, sahu, sa, sahem, sahu. From the swirling sand, see feet appear and legs. And in front of you materializes a tall woman golden, the head of a lion. You think you should be afraid, but you're not. She's very powerful, but she means you no harm. She stretches out her hand and she may not speak to you, but you know she is asking you, what do you want? She looks at you and her eyes go to the core of who you are. She sees you. 
She knows you as her daughter. You stand and you think, what do I want? And as you are thinking in her hand outstretched to you, it comes, to, something is materializing on her palm. You reach out and she puts it in your hands. Sekhmet's gift to you. She begins to move back and the sand begins to swirl gently she begins to fade and you are left with this in your hands and you hear the voice coming to you in your head. This goes in your heart. You take this gift, you bring it to your heart and it becomes part of you. And just as you see the last part of her leaving, you remember, thank you, Sekhmet. Thank you. Thank you. And you hear kind of a purr on the wind as she leaves you. And the wind swirls around you. Just a light breeze. Your feet start getting a little cooler and your hands start to tingle and your feet or toes. You start to move and come back to your body where you are now in the Zoom meeting <laughs> from the Goddess Temple. Bringing Sekhmet with you is now she's committed, and you are too, to knowing her in your life. Come back now. Come back now. Come back now. Blessed be. Blessed be. So I was an apple, which is a symbol of the womb. The symbol of women. Of course, they don't really have apples as such. <laughs> They're different in Egypt. But it's the fruit, the fruit of the womb of creativity of life. Yeah. Um, she put a ball of light fire, like a sun, in my palm of my hand. Mm. So I put it to my heart. Yeah, I feel very blessed. Gonna, I'm going to nurture that and let it grow. Her breath. It was the it was the wind of the desert. Her breath, like uh, Sandy had spoken of, and um, it reminded me of a phrase that came to me in a in a vision once was that I am at the center. I meaning all of us, but I will say I because it came to me. I am at the center of the flame of inspiration. And the breath is the inspire, inspiring part of that. So that's, I'm going to sit with that as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. The sand. As, the, as you were talking about the sand and the wind, when you first talked about the sand, she came to me and just continued to just in and out, weaving in and out. Uh, I could see segment vision and also... For me, it was about, I am protected. Come to me, I am protected. So that is the, what I received from the meditation. And thank you so very much. I still feel that. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sikhnit. One fifth thought I'd like to leave with, and that is that the study of goddesses as a study of ourselves, the study of the archetypes that make all of us who we are. 
the lies that you may be ta told about a myth or the myth itself is just a myth. It's your relationship to that archetype that makes Sekhmet or any goddess live in your life, in society, and begins to help change the world. So I would encourage you to continue your relationship with Sekhmet and see what unfolds for you under her protection. Sasahem, Sahu. Sandy, thank you so much for that beautiful gift meditation. I will keep my gift to myself for now, uh, but I did also receive something wonderful and uh, surprising. And so I thank you for taking us through that. It was brief, but powerful. And thank you also, Sandy, for years and years and years of devoted teaching, sharing, and leading with the Goddess Temple and with all your other circles that you, that you lead and that you are part of. You're just an amazing woman, and I have just been so privileged. We have all been so privileged to be able to work with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to paraphrase. Well, actually, I'm not going to paraphrase. I'm going to quote one of our four mothers now, Jade Rivers. I would say something to Jade. She'd go, oh, that's just my yard. That's just my yard. <laughs> it's just our yard. Uh, let me run through just a few of the things that uh, struck me. First of all, harken back to the images, most of the images used of, of Sekhmet in that. They were what I refer to as Barbie-fied. They're highly sexualized. They're created by men. They are big breasted. They're, they're sort of that comic book, Wonder Woman, highly sexualized, not a real woman, a small waist, big breasts. But I would say 80% of the images used in the video were these, these images that are not the ones that women would choose for ourselves. Share about these, the, the way goddess is presented by mostly men in these immature, juvenile, comic book-like images. That was the first thing that I thought about was how men talk about women and then portray them in a way that is appealing to their eyes because a woman definitely would not do that. So it reminded me of men who want to abuse and control women, but want them to look appealing to them. Uh, I'm reading a book and in, in this book, it's uh, talking about early, uh, around 1715 and the man is sitting there telling the women how they need to behave but he's also letting them know when they don't look appealing to him they, he wants them ignorant but he wants them appealing and that's exactly what I thought about he's this man this average man is talking about goddess how she's evil how she's all of these things but he's making her look appealing to 
to his eyes, the big breasts, the small waist, and then the arms so that she could caress him because he is so immature it's so afraid of women so right. afraid and that's what i thought yeah. i thought she's juvenile and in in oh. these in these images women are not allowed to to be whole it's the madonna horror mm -hmm. thing where you know she's presented as kind of a a, a slut uh Vajra, you had some thoughts on on this barbification of goddess I, I love everything you said, Marsha. It's just, I just love how you framed it for what it is. And I wanted to spin off on this, the mention of power, the fear, the fear. All of these images um, are an expression of the fear of the power. And so, um, so this becomes eroticized. So he can have some sense of power over it because he gets all gets off on it. That gives him a sense of power, and it's demonized. Um, and what's being demonized is our precious protective power, our woman's war for life, and we need to just walk, walk right past that, walk right over that that those men would do that, and go straight for the protection of life. It's so clearly, it's so clearly, the more they eroticize the woman, the more is an expression of their fear of our power over their psyches. Well, the female body has the power over the male psyche. And he has two choices to try and control it and then, you know, denigrate it or to revere it. So, you know, and just like us, if we, if we were afraid of the goddess, if, if she's like becomes awesome to us, we need to just, and our own power. We're afraid of our own power. We need to revere it and surrender to it and not try to control it. So that was my take on all those images. Yeah, I, I agree with what all of you are saying and that's what I felt as well. And what came to mind was how, how are women, how are we, how are our thoughts in this, uh, in our current events or our current day, our current day life how are we m moving this mythology, this falsehood forward in that way? And in also what what splashed before me was the was the red blood, and what showed was the the blood of life, and that women that men fear the blood, they fear our blood because it is life and it's powerful and all life comes from it follow up with what mata said we bleed and we don't die and the way that men bleed is with war and unfortunately that fear has existed and continues to exist until we as women not barbie dolls can come out in our strength and let men know hey, it's okay to be a strong woman. We can actually help you. <laughs> you don't have to do it all yourself. It's not easy being a man in this culture either because you're expected to be all things. But Sekhmet as cannot be barbified. Even when she was, her, her form has always been the woman, the naked woman with the breasts, with the lion head and I don't know what to tell men about except to be who I am with them. I would like to briefly touch on this concept that continues to be retold about Sekhmet, that she is the daughter of Ra, that he created her and uh, that uh, he came before her, which as we know from the older teachings is absolutely not the truth. Also, the subsequent idea that she's this sort of, she becomes, in the minds of men who are telling these stories, she becomes a, a daddy's girl, very similar to Athena, being, being um, the avenger of daddy, the one who is completely supportive. It says in the video, she stood by the king's side against all and uh, even into death she stood by his side. And this idea that men can co-opt 
woman and goddess and turn them into the defender and promoter of patriarchy and of the dominator model and completely subsume the original all-powerful goddess who was was the first and who created men we talk about parthenogenesis uh, this this patriarchal reversal that a man created woman yeah um it's always the reversal and it goes back to the the fear of woman uh so you either control or revere and so with the goddess they had to not revere her to the extent that she was originally revered but to make her a daughter to make her a mate to give children the son as they did the set of it and sandy pointed out and the nuclear family as opposed to the village and the same family of the children in the village are cared for and nurtured by all of the community that the nuclear family is that separation and that control of women um and are cut off from our sisterhood we're cut off from our power um or cut off from the collective power that we are as women so it's all about either controlling woman's power or revering it yeah thinking of what you said Vajra, about making her daddy's girl or a sexual object um or revering but the idea of being equal in power and sharing that power is kind of a foreign idea into patriarchy which does the top down like the pyramid you know the king at the top and everybody gets their power from the king instead of the the, the sharing of that power and the designating different different parts of that power the people who can do that job and if it's a woman so be it but women have their own innate power and men don't understand it unfortunately and it's then leads to barbification i like that word <laughs> <laughs> i think how do you how do you deal with that you have to be a strong woman but you have to do it and to me it's the it's the iron fist and the velvet glove if you're too strident you become the bad mom right if you're too sexy then you're like a slut you're a whore there is no right way that you can deal in patriarchy and be accepted you just have to be who you are be honest and be up front and say hey you know i'm not threatening you but this is the way it is this is the truth in order for the male and the the king to be dominant they have to have all females or goddesses be controlled and dominated by as a daddy's girl it's so absurd and ludicrous it's it's just it's an it's a it is so uh it's almost their like orgasmic for them they've got their uh expression it, it feeds their ego it it feeds their their lack of power and their lack of of knowledge and knowing it's, yeah. it just makes me mad <laughs> <laughs> when we think of a princess she's dependent upon the king when we think of a queen she is not dependent upon him so it's it, it's like okay we can't have her be the queen we have to have her be this cute little princess who is dependent upon the male and again it goes back to men being afraid of a woman's power in her full power and we as women we have to make sure that we are not barbifying ourselves and i like what sandy said you know where do you fit in in patriarchy and it's sort of i i, I remember that because it's like for me depending on how my hair was whether it was long and straight or if it was a little pixie cut it was amazing how men responded in corporate america <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite interesting so it, it, again it's this is just another example of how men try to control woman's power by making her less than not equal and the fact that he, she came from a man no woman came first <laughs> no yeah <laughs> <laughs>
Forget that. Next to that, as Ava says. So let's talk for a moment about the patriarchal reversal that the video uh, promotes. She delights in bloodshed. She spreads disease. And this is a patriarchal reversal because actually we know the truth is from ancient times to modern times from you know from as far back as we can know and right up until this very moment women are not the ones who delight in bloodshed this is another patriarchal reversal taking the truth and upending it on its head and saying the opposite uh, who delights in bloodshed is the average man as we see from all the wars that that average men and awful men foment in, in the world. So to accuse this female goddess of delighting in bloodshed, she's out of control, it says in the, uh, in the video, and she spreads disease and, and she's murderous in her rampage. Well, these are, the, this is men, average men, describing male-centric behaviors, pa patriarchal behaviors, dominator model behaviors. And once again, we're always saying, you know, not all men, not all men, of course. We talk about in the Queen teachings, we talk about average men, which is who you see ruling the world today. 80% uh, of men are average men, and they have these ideas about women on a sliding scale. Some are heading more towards aware, and that's 10% of men uh, on average 10 percent of men are aware they need no correction no boundaries they revere life they honor woman they understand all of these things they are wonderful but the world is run by average and awful men average m men making up 80 percent and awful men and you can decide for yourself who awful man is i've got a i've got a list in my own head who i think is awful but uh, that may, you know, be different from your list uh, politically. The awful men are 10%. So 10% aware, 80% average, which is how you see the world, you know, run today, because mostly men run the world uh, up until now, and uh, then 10% average. So when you see these patriarchal reversals, you know that it's actually men talking about themselves. Men are the ones who foment wars. Men are the ones who, quote, delight in bloodshed. Men are the ones, average men, not aware men, but average men, are the ones who are out of control and, and need some boundaries. So projection, you know, projection. So <laughs> Bob is nodding her head. And I like what Mary said on the chat that by being the revenger, then she becomes in the supporter of the, of the patriarchal ideas of, of power over, of violence, of um, bloodshed. And that's the only way you get power is by defeating people and, and enslaving them instead of sharing that power and working together for the good of all. Um, it just keeps going back to the um, demonization of woman's ferocity so that it had to be into, channeled into the wars, into aggression, into uh, violence, as opposed to the uh, enormous power of women to create and protect life and revel in natural blood. You know, revel in their natural blood as opposed to the blood of war. But revenge, revenge is different than, um, I noticed on the chat that someone mentioned that revenge can bring balance. Sekhmet in her form as destroyer or avenger is about righteous rage. It's about social justice. It's not about, you did me wrong, I'm gonna get you back. Which is let's yeah. point out that there's a difference between revenge and avenge. So yes. she's the avenger, not the revenger. She can no. be the avenger in correct situations. Can, I really see the idea of social justice and that all children deserve to be protected and the idea of equality. I really associate that very much with Sekhmet as the lady of the land, as the lady of life. And when I see in the breath of life, and I've, as I experience her with sort of like Kali in many ways, 
but in a, in a different form that if she sweeps the desert clean with a sandstorm, it's because it needs the cleansing. If, if she needs to send a plague, it's because that plague needs to be there so something else can grow. It's like Kali. It's you destroy in order to create. It is not about, I don't like you and I'm going to take revenge on you. Thank you. Thank you. Because yes. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. She, she does kill with fierce compassion and it's, it's for our own good when she ends something, including life. So you and can, it's always in service to life. It's in service to life. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you. In service to life. You can and, use her in your own life to help take things away that no longer serve you. And to use that, that passion for social justice to, to look at yourself and things that, that you have internalized from patriarchy that no longer serve. And then she will take her claw and just ask her and she will help you. So what, what's important to know, in, in my view, is that the stories that are told about goddess are the veiled attempts to tell stories about women and also the attempt to train and teach us about ourselves, who we are supposed to be. This is, this is who you are, woman. You are this murderous, rapacious, destructive, out of control, bloodthirsty woman. And we must, for the good of all humanity, we must control you. That is actually the message of thousands and thousands of years of these patriarchal stories about Sekhmet. And they are not just about Sekhmet. What I started learning when I started learning about goddess and researching them is that almost all of the stories that you will see and hear retold on YouTube and in, in most books are the later patriarchal mythologies meant to control and suppress and oppress and demean and denigrate and deny women. If you peel away the layers of, of these stories, you always get to the truth. And the truth is that there's one great mother. She has many, many names. She is compassionate. She is all powerful. She is good. She does everything for your good, for life, in, as Vajra says, in service to life. And, and those are the stories that we need to retell. We've had many guest speakers over the years uh, in, at Goddess Temple Circles, and I became very aware early on that I had to vet speakers more carefully because sometimes we'd be concentrating on this goddess or that goddess from this culture or that culture and our very own speaker was a woman who did not know the truth and she would retell some of these these patriarchal stories about goddess and i was like oh no no so it's really important that when we hear a negative story about any goddess any, and they're all aspects of the one great mother, of course, with she of 10,000, thousand names, that we stop and say, wait a minute, let's peel away the layers of history. Let's see what the truth really is, because this does not sound right. Let's share a little bit about this concept of goddess, and you might as well just say woman, because that's what it really is, of goddess and woman as being able to be tricked because that's the primary element of the story is that Ra tricks her. She's foolish. She doesn't know the difference between, you know, pomegranate juice and blood. She's an idiot you know, and she's able to be tricked. And this is a, a demeanment of woman, uh, the fact that she is able to be tricked. This is telling us that we cannot, as women, really trust ourselves. We have to trust men because Ra, the great sun god, knows better and he's going to give us what we need. Mm -hmm. This concept that we are taught in this particular story of thousands of years that we, woman, goddess, is able to be tricked. Experience teaches me that there are people out there who lie to get what they want. It's promoted by patriarchy. And I think those mythologies that are promoted, um, this, this fierce goddess who, who is 
just kills everybody and drinks their blood. And then we have to have a Bacchanal to, to get drunk, to honor her, so we can feel good about ourselves. All of that is promoted by patriarchy, and it has something to do with the honest truth of who we are as women. Our own self reflected in this archetype of strength. Look at the lion. Look at what lions do. Think about the element of the desert, of, of the heat, of the sun, of the, the earth that she comes from, that, that she's ancient, ancient. She's there before we ever came, and she will continue to be there long after we are gone. What is this lineage that we carry in our blood, in our bones, in our wombs, from these archetypes? This helps you grow as a woman. It helps you grow in strength. And this other, the mythology, take it with a grain of salt. It can be just monkey mind and mind chatter, and maybe there's something to it. But strain it through your own truth filter, and you don't have to believe everything that you're told. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Ajra, do you have any thoughts on this concept of woman not being able to trust herself and needing a man to tell her what's what, and also this idea of being able to be tricked? Well, you know, women are accused of being manipulative. That's an old trope. And yeah, in patriarchy, women have been manipulative because they couldn't, you know, you had to be either a wife or a prostitute for many centuries. Um, and so you had to manipulate your way to get things. But let's wait, let's roll it back to the beginning. Men manipulated women, manipulated the structure, manipulated and made, uh, replaced the goddess with the male god, reversed everything. So that was the major manipulation. So let's see who actually manipulated things here and who manipulated the myth of Sekhmet. Who did that manipulation? It was for, it was for male, uh, male benefit. Right. That's my, right. Th my take. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I'd just like to drop a seed in uh, for, for women to think about. Beer and wine were ancient libations to goddess. And they were created in a sacred way. They were used in a sacred way. And only in a sacred way. They weren't just drunk for the hell of it, you know. And I see it as another patriarchal reversal or co-optation that beer particularly has been turned in, which used to be a sacred libation to goddess thousands of years ago, has been turned into this swigging thing in the summer on the beach or at a ball game or men just drinking beer and having no awareness of the, the sacred meaning originally of beer. So, and, and wine, and wine also, but I say beer because um, beer was definitely associated with Sekhmet in ancient times. So we don't have time to discuss that, but uh, this is an important thing in our culture that all these previously sacred substances have now been turned by our dominator model culture into this just no sacredness at all, just using it to get drunk or using it in this casual way to go to a bar and watch strippers and drink beer. And that's wrong. I make a judgment now that is wrong, that is bad, that is disgusting, and we must stop it. We must stop it. And that's not to say you can't have a glass of wine casually, uh, because I do often, but before I take the first sip, silently, inwardly to myself, I always say, I drink to goddess, I drink to life. I drink to that all is well. I, I have my own private way of drinking alcoholic beverages. And I suggest that that's something that we should teach men because they do not know and they have forgotten. So thank you very much. Let us start to draw to a graceful conclusion, remembering that we can talk freely as soon as we've closed the services. From my heart, from my womb, from all of our hearts and our wombs. Thank you, Sekhmet. Thank you for enduring through the centuries, for being with us today, for inspiring us, for firing our passions, 
for strengthening our resolve for your model of social justice, protection, healing, and for your breath of life. We know you're going to always be with us. And we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Blessed be. Thank you. Blessed be. Thank you. And if you are not a member, we still need you. We still need you to keep our sacreds in storage and find a new place. So we really appreciate our members sticking with us and continuing your membership every, every month. And if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member and just email us and we'll send you the way to do that easily and gracefully. So we thank everything that is including all of our wonderful members and the women who have been on this call today, our naiads helping to facilitate the uh, uh, Marsha and uh, Mata, our naiads, our special guest speaker, Sandy Limina, Priestess Sandy, and also honored guest Vajra. Vajra, would you take us through as we thank North, South, East, and West, Air, Fire, Water, and Earth, we thank our guardians would you also thank goddess, she who is everything and everywhere and cannot be called in or dismissed. Please let us be aware of her as a presence ongoing in our life with your gratitude, your expression of gratitude. Divine mother, in your many, many forms so that we can comprehend something of you deep within us. Your many names so that you may touch us individually and speak to us individually and ignite us individually. We are so grateful to have your knowledge at this time on the earth for your bounteous blessings through Earth Mother. Earth Mother, we thank you for beauty, food, water, everything that sustains our physical bodies and our spirits. Great Goddess of all, you are our innermost self. You have said this in the Tantras, worship me as your innermost self. Help us to do this and thereby find strength and beauty and peace and power. So be it. Thank you, Divine Mother. Blessed be. Our next service will be September 6th, Autumn Increasing. We did not have time to talk about the Queen Archetype because Sekhmet was so fascinating. We had to discuss her. So we did not talk about the Queen Archetype and uh, the element of water. Our guest speaker will be Marsha Lang, uh, leading us in a puja to Lakshmi and the uh, principle of prosperity as we claim our harvest. So we very much look forward to that. We conclude this wonderful circle of women. So grateful to everyone. I have a burning question. Yeah. Where do people go to donate if they're not a member? www.goddesstempleoc.org. There's a way to donate uh, on our page there. Uh -huh.